Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled How to Investigate Behavior and Cognitive Abilities of Individual Rodents in a Social Group. My name is Andy Henton and I will be your host for today's event. Our session today is sponsored by TSC Systems and is focused on high throughput behavioral phenotyping of individual rodents within their social environment. In addition, we're going to talk about home cage automation technology that is supporting decreased data variability and workload to the researcher while increasing overall animal welfare in parallel. To show how this can be achieved, our three speakers will discuss specific operation of the IntelliCage system and associated software for creating automated behavioral paradigms, continuous data collection, and downstream data analysis. Okay, so our first presenter joining us today is Dr. Holger Russick. Dr. Russick completed his PhD in Natural Science at the Behavioral Neurobiology Laboratory of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland. Specifically, Dr. Russick has conducted research in animal models of schizophrenia and associated behavioral and cognitive applications, including combined behavioral testing with functional MRI. So now as scientific director at TSC Systems, he is heavily involved with communications between uh, product development teams and research scientists in the field using instrumentation in various behavioral neuroscience applications. Today, Dr. Rusk is going to provide a high-level overview of the IntelliCage system and its associated software, which enables the creation and control of various behavioral tests and analysis of resulting data. Following, we will hear from Dr. David Wolfer. Dr. Wolfer completed his medical degree at the University of Zurich and following pursued various academic research positions at the university's Institute of Anatomy. He completed his habilitation thesis in anatomy in 1998 at the University of Zurich and was appointed to Associate Professor of Anatomy at the University and ETH Zurich in 2005. Dr. Wolfer's research focus is cognitive and behavioral neuroscience. Specifically, his research group uses mouse models to gain a better understanding of the role of the hippocampus in the control of behavior under both normal and disease conditions. Today, Dr. Wolfer is going to discuss behavioral phenotyping using automated home cage systems, specifically reviewing how to move from adaptation stages to cognitive test batteries. In addition, he will discuss hippocampus-dependent spatial learning tasks and measuring motor impulsivity using the IntelliCage system. And third, we will be joined by Dr. Uh, Evelina Kanapska. Dr. Knaska's doctoral training took place at the Necke Institute of Experimental Biology in Warsaw and included a three-month stay at the laboratory of Hans-Peter Lipp at the University of Zurich. After obtaining her PhD and spending two years of postdoctoral training at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, she returned to the Necke Institute where she is now the head of the Laboratory of Emotions Neurobiology. Her research interests focus on the mechanisms by which different populations of neurons affect processing of emotional states in the brain and on novel experimental paradigms suitable for such studies. Today, she will be talking about specific methods for monitoring different measures of mouse behavior at the same time and comparing different behaviors in well-balanced conditions in the IntelliCage system. Okay, thank you, Andy, for the introduction. And welcome, everybody, to our first scientific webinar on the IntelliCage a home cage based fully automated system to investigate the behavioral and cognitive performance of mice living in a social group and I hope I can address some points which are related to the points of the first polling into my presentation. The IntelliCage has been developed to overcome some limitations of classical behavioral testing which we are all facing in our daily lab routine. Rodents are social animals, however, in most of the classical behavioral paradigms, we test animals individually. The translational importance of social behavior in mice models is relevant since alterations are present in most neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases such as autism, schizophrenia, depression, and Alzheimer's disease. A problem is also in classical behavioral phenotyping is the inconsistency of genetic differences between labs. This is due to different experimenters, experimental setups, environments, and other factors. Therefore, a reduced stress induced by handling and a standardized equipment should lead to enhanced data quality. The need for high throughput testing emerged with the need to screen genetically modified mice. Sorry, I forgot to press the button. Um, 
most paradigms are not fully automated, very labor intensive, and often not address the different behavioral performance in the light and the dark phase. Classical behavioral apparatus are mostly designed for a specific paradigm and a single animal which requires many different apparatus and therefore lab space and lots of animals. So comprehensive Comprehensive phenotyping requires continuous circadian monitoring, flexibility, and the possibility to test batteries of behavioral experiments to cover all different behavioral modalities. The IntelliCage can be seen as a behavioral micro-laboratory allowing automated individual assessment of spontaneous and cognitive behavior. Central is basically a standard red type 2000 cage containing a foot grid and shelters for increased animal welfare. Each of the four identical operant conditioning corners accommodate only one single mouse at a time and liquid reward can be provided in the corners. A variety of sensors and actors provide the possibility to monitor the animals and program different behavioral paradigms. Illumination and temperature sensors also control the test environment. The sensors in the system monitor the behavior of the animals. The actors perform the hardware events that shape the response of the animals according to the behavioral paradigm. If an animal enters one of these operant conditioning corner, the visit is detected by a temperature sensitive presence sensor and the RFID antenna in front of the corner reads the ID of the transponder implanted subcontinuously in the animal. An OSPOC sensor here is located in front of the automated doors which give access to the water bottles which are also equipped with a liquor meter. Three LEDs placed above the nose poke unit can be used to provide visual conditioning stimuli. The air puff can be used for negative reinforcement similar to a food shock in classical conditioning experiments. So taken together, the IntelliCage can measure the number of visits, the number of nose pokes, and the number of licks separately for each mice of a group of mice using the RFID technology. Actors and sensors can be used flexibly to program a variety of different behavioral tasks such as operant or classical conditioning paradigms. As an example, Operant conditioning forms an association between a behavior, pressing a lever in a Skinner box, or nose poking in the IntelliCage, and the resulting event, for instance, access to water, which can be automatically performed in the IntelliCage. The flexible IntelliCage software allows the shaping of the animal's response, such as an increase of the fixed ratio 1 to fixed ratio 5, or the modulation of a reinforcer, such as the length of the reward or access or the air puff. For your reference, I listed here some behavioral paradigms spanning from spontaneous behavior, operant conditioning, to spatial and temporal learning tasks, and Evelina and David will provide some examples in their subsequent talks. The IntelliCage is operated by a software which provides a graphical oriented and user friendly user interface. The software consisting, is consisting of three parts, the designer, the controller and the analyzer. The designer allows the definition of behavioral tasks which can be stored for the use in the controller. Animals can be assigned to groups or clusters in which correct or incorrect corner visits or nose pokes can be defined. Important 
series of different experiments can be programmed to create automated cognitive test batteries without any human interference. The controller runs the experiment. The program stores the behavioral data and control the actors such as the doors or the apath. A big advantage is the visibility of parameters during the ongoing experiment which allows an online monitoring such as the development of a learning curve. The alarm function is a very important tool for animal welfare and is capable to inform the researcher via email if an animal did not drink for a specific period of time. In the analyzer you can explore, extract and pre-process all the data. A data overview is available in a graphical form or in a text form which can be exported to use in statistical programs. However, basic statistical tools are incorporated into the software already. Raw data and log files are always stored unmodified. After this short software review, I come back to the benefits of the IntelliCage. A single controller license can handle eight cages with 16 animals each. So social housing is a key feature and a prerequisite for high throughput testing, animal welfare and translational value of the research carried out with the IntelliCage. Therefore, the social behavior and the hierarchy in the IntelliCage can be monitored and analyzed, such as the behavior of mice observing conspecific animals visiting a corner. Dr. Pakitna used the IntelliCage in his recent paper and claimed that this is the first method that permits the mapping of social network of mice and he investigated the impact of this, of this social hierarchy in reward-induced behavior. A additional benefit of the IntelliCage is the increased standardization and the reduced data variability. It has been previously shown by Crabb and Walson that the researcher is the biggest source of data variability in classic behavioral experiments such as the elevated plasmase. In this paper, Dr. Lip compared the exploration behavior of three different strains in two different labs assessed either by classical video tracking or in the IntelliCage. As you can see, the data between the two labs are much more consistent compared or are much more consistent in the IntelliCage compared to the classical method. Going a little bit more in detail about the point you raised during the polling question, automation of classical behavior paradigms. Is it possible to transfer time and labor consuming behavioral paradigms into the IntelliCage? I focus here on the Morris water maze, which is a standard paradigm to investigate spatial learning and memory in rodents in which the animal has to learn the position of a submerged platform in a pool based on outside cues. Since Evelina will talk in her talk specifically about that, I will just let you know that the concept of learning a position in space can be transferred into the IntelliCage in two different ways. Animals can learn to prefer a corner in space if you give sucrose or animals can learn to avoid a corner if an air puff is provided as an aversive stimulus in that corner. Dr. Konopka showed clearly 
that DICEL-1 gene inactivation leads to an increase of spatial memory performance in the probe trial of a Morris water maze task as well as in a place preference task in the IntelliCage. A correlation between escape latency and percent correct corner choice have been published also in a different paper. This leading to the assumption that individual behavioral phenotypes identified within a social group like in the IntelliCage are comparable to individual behavioral assessment. Although the time an animal need to learn a specific paradigm is determined by the animal model, the amount of workload for the experiment can differ significantly. As an example, to perform the visual acquisition, probe and reversal trial of a classical water maze experiment, the researcher have to invest at least seven full days of intensive work. A similar phenotype can be identified in the IntelliCage by investing one hour of cage preparation if you have already injected your animals with an RFID transponder. Taken together, this favors the use of the IntelliCage also as a general behavioral screening tool in the lab. In summary, I think the IntelliCage is a sophisticated cognitive test system of the next generation, which is unique in the market. Testing animals in an automated system under group housing conditions have positive effects on, el on welfare, efficiency, and accuracy. IntelliCage is an ideal tool for long-term high-throughput behavioral phenotyping with great experimental flexibility which has the capacity to reduce lab space, animals and costs. And I truly believe that the consideration of social behavior in the experimental design of basic and translational research using mice models may improve the predictive validity of new preventive and therapeutic strategies. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction and also thanks for the opportunity to present here at this webinar. Uh, what I would like to do today is to show you a few examples how we use IntelliCage with mice, ranging from the observation of spontaneous behavior and then moving to some more complex cognitive tasks. So as we begin to study mice in the IntelliCage system, they need first to familiarize themselves with the system and for that we run them through three stages of adaptation. In the first free adaptation, all doors are open, so all eight bodies are accessible at all times. Then in the second stage, called no spoke adaptation, the doors are closed, but they can be opened anytime by performing a no spoke. And then in the third adaptation stage, Doors are also closed, but they can be opened only during two one-hour lasting drinking sessions each day. Data are being recorded during all these stages, already during free adaptation. And as Holger mentioned in his introduction, there are three events that are recorded by the cages, visits, folks, and licks. They can be counted. We can look at their temporal and spatial distribution. We can measure the duration we can put them in relation to each other and all that makes up for a total of about 50 variables that we can extract and compute to characterize the behavior of the animal during these adaptation stages. Now, during the free adaptation stage there are virtually no limits to the behavior of the animal. So the data we collect during that stage gives us a quantitative profile of the spontaneous behavior of animals in the cages. We wondered how many dimensions of truly independent variation are captured by these 50 variables we measured. So in order to find that out, we run a principal component analysis on a data set coming from about 1,500 animals that went through that stage. 
So PCA is a statistical procedure that eliminates redundancy from a set of measured variables, 50 in our case, by extracting virtual variables that are fewer in number but that are truly independent from each other. So these are called principal components. These principal components can be related back to the original measured variables by computing correlations. So what you see here is actually a correlation matrix and green colors they stand for strong positive correlations, red colors for strong negative correlations. So we can use this correlation matrix to attach meaning to this component and also to group them in a meaningful way. So that's what you see in this part of the slide. So we have two of the components that are related to spontaneous preferences that the animals develop for corners and sides, inside corners. Then we have four components that describe visits and pokes and various characteristics of them. We have a set of three components that are more related to licking activity, describing lick number, for instance, frequency of licking during a poke. And then finally, we have two components that describe how the activity in the cage distributes across the 24-hour cycle. So the numbers that you see on the right side here indicate the proportion of variance in the original data set that is extracted by these groups of components. So in the first study, we used component cores to compare strains, which is other. So we run one experiment in which three strains, the DBA2, 129S2, and Belf C were compared against black six mice as a reference. And what you see here in the table are the component score differences that we found relative to black six animals. So green color stands for higher scores in the strain that we looked at and red colors stand for lower scores compared to the reference of black 6. If you look at the results that we obtained for these three strains, then you see each of them has a unique profile of differences with respect to black 6. So basically each of these strains can be recognized by its profile of spontaneous behavior already during this three adaptation phase. In order to know whether these differences that we found in this experiment are actually reliable across labs and across experiments. We repeated one of the comparisons, the comparison of EBA to black six mice several times in our own lab and we also asked colleagues at other universities to run the same comparison in their cages. And as you see, most of the components reveal a highly reliable pattern of differences between DBA and black six mice. There are some that are somewhat more jumpy, but for most of them we see patterns that are highly reproducible across labs and studies, meaning that already during the first week of testing in the IntelliCage we can get reliable quantitative profiles describing the spontaneous behavior of the animals. We went on to look at the effect of brain lesion. And what we first did was to look at animals with complete hippocampal lesions and compare them to sham operated controls. And what we saw, these are again differences, this time between the experimental animals and their control groups. We saw that hippocampal lesions in produce a highly replicable set of differences across experiments with animals having higher spontaneous corner preferences, for instance, have it shorter visits, more visits without nose pokes, and so on. When we compared this to animals that has uh, had a lesion of the dorsolateral striatum, which are shown here, then these lesions produced a clearly different pattern, and again, also animals that had a lesion of the medial habenula, again here the pattern of changes we found was clearly different from that with hippocampal lesion, although there was one change at least that was similar to what we saw also in animal hippocampal lesions. So this is a set of experiments where we applied lesions to peripheral nerves and we saw again different patterns there. Now an inter interesting question is 
if we have a line of mutant animals that we test for the first time in IntelliCage, what changes of spontaneous behavior during the pre-adaptation phase do we see there in comparison to the wild type controls? So that's the data that are shown here in the bottom part of this table. So let's focus on one mutant line, which is a double mutant that it is deficient for both the beta amyloid precursor protein and its related protein APLP2. And if you look at the changes that this mutation introduced, you can see a high degree of similarity to what hippocampal lesions do, but there are also some differences on some of the components. So this mutation produces a pattern of changes that is similar but not identical to what we see with hippocampal lesions. By contrast, another line which is depicted here at the bottom, these are animals that overexpress as a transgene, erythropoietin, and the main problem is that they have a massively increased hematocrit, and this of course produces a completely different pattern of changes during spontaneous behavior testing, and you see mainly changes, and the changes here are mainly in the components that are related to lipping frequency and licking. So this indicates that already during the very first week of testing in IntelliCage when the animals are just adapting to the cage, we can already look at the spontaneous behavior and see whether the pattern of changes has some similarities to conditions we already know, either other mutations or brain lesions that we have tested in the cage, and this get, can give us hints on how to proceed with testing on these animals, which further maybe more complex and time-consuming testing batteries we can implement here. So let me now jump to the last phase of adaptation to the IntelliCage, which we called drinking session adaptation. As you may remember, there the doors are always closed and only during two hours during the dark phase the animals can assess the drinking water by making nose pokes and opening the doors. Normal mice, which are shown by blue dots in these graphs, they adapt their activity very nicely to this drinking session schedule. So what you see depicted here is the number of visits per hour they do, and you see a peak during both drinking sessions. Now when we tested animals with hippocampal lesions in this third adaptation stage, we found that they were completely unable to adapt their activity to the drinking session schedule. They were mainly active in the hour before the drinking session. And this lesion effect was highly specific because we saw no such changes either after lesions of prefrontal cortex or of the dorsolateral striatum. Now let me move on to a third example in which I would like to show you how we implemented a hippocampus dependent learning task or actually a whole set of learning tasks in the IntelliCage. So the common principle of this set of tasks is that it, they are based on a drinking session schedule, so water is available only during two drinking sessions in the dark phase, and this time only in one of the four corners. What changes between the different tasks is the rule that predicts for the animal where water will be available. And we begin with a very simple conditions where water is available always in the same corner during one week. And then we move on to a reversal learning phase where that location is moved to the opposite corner. That would be then the reversal of corner preference. And then we can make the task even more difficult by changing the location of water availability in every single drinking session so the, the animals have constantly to relearn where water is available. Then there are even more difficult tasks where the animal have to learn to visit the corner in a certain sequence, either anti or clockwise, which is the chaining and the patrolling task. Now these tasks are meant to be hippocampus dependent, so we tested them using animals with hippocampal lesions. That's the orange data points, the blue data points are the sham operating controls, and what you see Plotted is the number of correct choices as function of time, so that we can see the progress of learning. 
And what you see here, if you look at the data of all the tasks that I just described to you, is a very nice dissociation. The animals with hippocampal lesions are just fine in the most simple task, also in the reversal task. They were fine in this experiment. So that means that you can think of this very simple task as an equivalent maybe of the cue navigation in the water maze that we can use to see whether an animal can just handle the motor and sensory requirements of this battery of tasks. But as you can see here, yeah. as we move to more complex rules, then the animals with hippocampal lesions get into great trouble and are impaired in all these more complex tasks compared to the controls. To test for the specificity of this test, we also run animals with a dorsolateral striatal lesion in the task battery. And as you can see from the data, they were fine in all of the tasks, even in the most complex ones. Then we went on to use this test battery to test mutant animals. And as one example, I show you this double mutant line, which has already been shown during free adaptation. So these are animals that are deficient for both beta amyloid precursor protein and also the related protein APLP2. They show a pattern that is highly similar to what we see in hippocampally lesioned animals. So they are impaired in serial reversal, in chaining and patrolling, although their impairing is, impairment is milder. As training goes on, they are eventually able to catch up with control in most of these tasks. And this is completely in line to the findings that we had when we tested them in conventional hippocampus-dependent tasks. For instance, in the eight-arm radial maze, they were also impaired compared to controls. And the further difference compared to the hippocampally lesioned animals is that these mutants actually perform slightly better in the most simple version of the task, which is probably related to their reduced exploratory drive, which was also evident when we tested them in a classical open field test. We also tested animals with the medial abdominal lesions in this test battery. And as you can see here, they show a profile of the effects that is virtually identical to what we saw in hippocampally lesioned animals. So they were normal in acquisition or very slightly impaired in reversal training and then strongly impaired in all the remaining more complex tasks. So even though these animals do not have hippocampal lesions, they share their pattern of deficits with animals that have hippocampal lesions. So that just illustrates that in order to characterize an experimental conditions, you always need to run a whole battery of tasks. And only by combining the data of several tasks, you can reach a valid conclusion. And the nice thing about the IntelliK system is that you can basically run all these different tasks in the same system and automatically. So actually, we went on to implement a test that addresses a completely different domain of cognitive function. It's designed to measure motor impulsivity, which is defined as a reduced ability to withhold inappropriate responses. Motor impulsivity is classically tested in Skinner boxes in reaction time tasks. So what we try to do here is to use this uh, learning corners as sort of a mini Skinner box and to implement a reaction time task there. So this is how it works. At any time, the animals can enter a corner, do a nose poke to start a trial. This will identify the correct corner and it will also start a delay period which can range from 0.5 to 2.5 seconds. At the end of this delay period, a cue light will go on and the door will open on the correct size so the animal can make a second nose poke to drink. So this would be considered a correct response. The most important measure in this test is the premature responses, which are nose pokes that are made during the delay period. We want to validate the IntelliCage version of a reaction time task by running a comparison between BBA2 mice and Black 6 mice because it is known 
from conventional reaction time task in Skinner box is that the two animals are more impulsive so that they make more premature responses in such a task. And we found exactly the same when running these animals in our task in IntelliCase. So what you see here is the number of premature responses plotted as a function of time to see the progress of learning and as a function of delay. So you can easily see here that all animals learned, but the D2 animals made significantly more premature responses than the reference strain black 6. That's exactly the wrong result that we expected. And we can also see that the number of premature responses increases with the length of delay. That's also something that we would expect. We also saw a second difference between these two strains, which is also confirmed by the results of of uh, classical reaction time tasks. So once the Q light comes on in a correct trial, the D2 animals take longer to respond to that stimulus and to make their second nose book. And that's exactly what was also found in conventional reaction time task, only that this testing phase lasts exactly one week, whereas a reaction time task in a conventional in a box is a lot longer and uh, is a lot more labor intensive because the animals are run individually in testing sessions. We went on to test also the animals with medial habenular lesions in this task and again we found increased impulsivity as evidenced by a higher number of premature responses. In this animals the reaction time was absolutely normal. These animals were also tested in a conventional form of a reaction time task in a Skinner box and the same result was found there as well. So increased number of premature responses and normal reaction time. So with this I would like to end my presentation and come to a summary. I hope that I can, could convince you that we can use this IntelliCatch system for very different behavioral phenotyping applications, starting with the observation of spontaneous behavior and moving on to more specific tests that ad address specific domains of cognitive function. To end, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and partners in the experiments that I showed you and also our funding sources. Well, that's it from my side. Thank you for listening to me. Yes, hello. Uh, Hello everybody, uh, I'd like to tell you today about several behavioral designs that allow for assessing cognitive functioning of mice. Uh, so let's start what I plan to cover today. So I'd like to show you two examples of what we can achieve with the IntelliCage. In the first one, I will show you how we try to understand links between behavior and the amygdala. The amygdala is the key structure in the brain that is involved in processing of emotions. Uh, we are especially interested in neuronal circuits underlying appetitively and aversively motivated behaviors. So to study the circuits, we need to compare different behaviors in well-balanced conditions as well as we need to collect brain tissue at the certain time points following the behavioral training. So I will try to show you how can we do it using IntelliCages. In the second example, I will show you how we can monitor different measures of mouse behavior at the same time. In my lab, we, are, we test mice for different symptoms of autism. Uh, we model, uh, the first of all, cognitive aspects of perseveration. Uh, perseveration is one of key symptoms uh, in uh, autism, and we try to separate it from uh, different cognitive impairments uh, in mice. Uh, we would like to get the most reliable and most stable measures of these behaviors. To do it, we standardize the behavioral tests by comparing results of several cohorts of mice. Uh, moreover, I would like to show you how performance of mice differ during the light-dark cycle. Um, so, but let me start with the brief comparison of classical behavioral tests and the IntelliCage system. Uh, 
Holger, as Holger already mentioned, um, it's the IntelliCAVE system uh, allow us to minimize the contact uh, of mice with an experimenter. Uh, also, uh, it allows to uh, um, to diminish isolation anxiety or to eliminate it because the mice are tested in the social group. Uh, and uh, also it's important that experiment is performed in a familiar environment. So all these features allows for uh, to limit uh, anxiety in animals. Um, and so anxiety is probably the most common factor that confounds behavioral results. Uh, it's important because, uh, for me, it's important because anxiety is comorbid with different psychiatric disorders we try to model in mice. So we would like to separate uh, the, the, the symptoms we, would, we try to model from anxiety. And this is, uh, one, the, this is one of the reasons uh, why we use the IntelliCage system. Um, and uh, it's uh, as you can uh, already uh, see, we can achieve quite replicable results with the system and uh, it's possible to monitor uh, behavior of mice for a long time so we can observe some differences uh, related to the uh, like dark cycle but also uh, longer biological rhythms. Uh, I will try to show you in the next slides uh, how behavior of mice can differ regarding to, to the uh, light diet dark cycle. And the last but not least, uh, it's very important that we can get quite comparable results using the intelli cages. Um, Um, so, uh, let's start with uh, the first example of the IntelliCage usage I would like to show you today. Um, I would like to show you how we compared appetively and aversively motivated behaviors in the IntelliCages. So, several years ago, we started with studying place preference and place avoidance learning in C57 mice. We established a paradigm in which mice had access to sweetened water in one of four corners, marked here in yellow, uh, or obtained an air puff after entering one of four corners, marked here in blue. So we had the behavioral designs for place preference training and place avoidance training. Uh, here are the results. They are expressed as the percentage of visits in the rewarded or punished corner. And as you can see, mice acquired both responses very effectively. Uh, then we use this procedure to investigate CFOS expression in the the amygdala. CFOS is a marker of neuronal activation. It's expressed in the nuclei of neurons activated, for example, by behavioral stimulation. So performing CFOS immunohistochemistry, we can see the activated neurons. The highest expression of CFOS is between 90 minutes to 2 hours after the stimulation. So we need to take the brains at, at this certain time point following the training. So to synchronize animals' activity, we used a shaping procedure in which animals had limited access to water. Only for 2 hours per day, it's marked here as water deprivation. Um, after three days of such procedure, uh, we started place preference and place avoidance learning, uh, as was already mentioned by Holger. Um, during the training, during the place preference training, mice had access to sweetened water in one of four corners. During the place avoidance training, uh, they obtained air puffs when entering one of four corners. We had also control groups in the appetitive conditions. Uh, mice had access to sweetened water in all four corners, so the location of the reward was not uh, 
uh, uh, did not depend on on the place was in all four uh, four corners. Uh, and uh, uh, for the place avoidance training, the control animals were in the same cages as the experimental mice, so they were exposed to noise or to mess in the cage, but they did not receive airpuffs directly. Um, after two hours of the training, we took the brains for immunohistochemistry. Uh, we carried out this experiment in three cages at the same time. So we collected three to four mice from one cage. So here are results of this experiment. We compared activation of CFOS in the amygdala and found different expression in the central part of the structure here. Uh, the expression was much higher in, the, uh, in, in mice that learned place preference, uh, comparing to place avoidance group. Then uh, we wanted to study the mechanism of the central amygdala involvement in appetitively motivated learning. We focus on uh, another protein, matrix metalloproteins 9, uh, MMP9. This is a protein involved in synaptic plasticity, in learning and memory, and is regulated by CFOS. Uh, so we started with studying uh, MMP9 knockout mice uh, in the exactly the same paradigms, uh, behavioral paradigms I showed you before, in place preference learning paradigm, in which mice had access to sweet and water in one of four corners, and in place avoidance learning, in which, during which they obtained air puffs uh, in one of four corners. We also checked the animals in the, um, the paradigm in which the uh, visiting of one of four corners was uh, rewarded just with tap water uh, to eliminate the possible effects of the of the taste um, and we observed that uh, in both paradigms in which we used reward the MMP9 knockouts were impaired uh, however the, the, the uh, place avoidance learning was intact So then uh, we wanted to better balance conditions of appetitively and aversively motivated trainings. We wanted to use uh, the same modality of the reward and punishment. So we decided to, to test uh, to, to different tastes using as a reward sweetened water and for uh, punishment quinine solution which is very bitter. Uh, so the animals had to discriminate between two bottles in one of the corners. Uh, in uh, appetitively motivated learning, they had one bottle with sweetened water and another one with tap water. Uh, in aversively motivated learning, they had uh, one bottle with quinine solution and another one with tap water. Uh, and here are the results. Um, so. Here, uh, are, uh, here is a probability of no spokes made to uh, the correct or incorrect bottle. Uh, so the chance level is uh, 0.5. Uh, and you can see that uh, white type mice perform this task better. Uh, Whereas uh, in the aversively motivated task, uh, we uh, did not observe any differences. Um, we also decided to calculate another measure, uh, more memory-based, because uh, in our design, mice had uh, mice could perform more than one nose poke uh, during every visit. Uh, we decided to count only the first nose pokes uh, during every visit as correct or incorrect. So it's more memory based. And again, uh, we had uh, some impairment in uh, MMP9 knockout mice, whereas uh, in appetitively motivated task, uh, 
but not in aversively motivated task. Uh, it, I would like also to show you that it's possible to measure different aspects of behavior at the same time in the intelligent cages. In this case, we measured a uh, number of leaks was a kind of control to uh, to show that our knockout mice drank the same amounts of uh, sucrose and quinine as, as uh, the control animals. Then, uh, because our first data showed that uh, this response is related to CFOS expression in the central part of the amygdala, we wanted to check if uh, this uh, role of uh, MMP9 is also uh, related to its function in, uh, in the structure. So we uh, injected uh, nanoparticles to, to, to the central amygdala of mice, uh, nanoparticles which uh, gradually released a specific inhibitor of MMP9, a protein called TIMP1, and uh, uh, then we performed exactly the same behavioral testing as I described before. So we tested uh, our mice in appetively motivated discrimination task and aversively motivated discrimination task. And again, we had the same result as with knockouts. Uh, it means that uh, the mice with uh, blocked act the activity of MMP9 in the central amygdala were impaired in appetively motivated learning, but not in aversively motivated one. So, we can conclude that MMP9 in the central amygdala plays a role in appetively motivated learning. So, now let's move to another example of the IntelliCage usage in the neurobiolog neurobiological studies. Uh, I would like to show advantages of monitoring different behavioral measures at the same time. So, as I mentioned in my lab, uh, we are interested in mouse models of autism. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder that is characterized by social deficits, difficulties in communication, and stereotype behaviors. All of these symptoms have to be met to diagnose autism, uh, though their severity can differ. So, we are developing different behavioral tests for automatic assessment of all autistic symptoms using different mouse models of autism. Uh, the data I'm going to present today uh, were obtained with the mice treated with uh, valproic acid, prenatal treated to valproic acid. Um, it's uh, a model uh, of, uh, of autism uh, in offspring uh, whose mothers were treated uh, this way, uh, which has a phase validity in the sense that a uh, higher rate of autism has been observed uh, in women treated with valproic acid during pregnancy. It is an until uh, epileptic drug. Uh, so, uh, we used in our studies two strains of mice, C57 and Bulb C, uh, that were tested in different behavioral measures. I, uh, I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, so, we focused on tests um, that could assess cognitive uh, rigidity and learning abilities at the same time. Uh, repetitive behaviors or perseveration means insistence on sam sameness, inability to break habits or change behavioral patterns. Um, but uh, autism is also uh, often diagnosed with uh, associated intellectual impairment. So, with cognitive deficits that are unrelated to repetitive or restricted behaviors. So, uh, our goal was to design the tests that allow to uh, model these uh, different symptoms separately. Uh, so, we use uh, 
to assess cognitive rigidity and uh, learning abilities, uh, we use the following scheme. Firstly, mice were adapted to the cage, then they were subjected to place preference learning, during which they had access to sweetened water in one of four corners, and then uh, they had reversal learning during this phase. Uh, sweetened water was uh, moved to the opposite corner, uh, but at the same time we recorded the visits to the corner that was no longer uh, rewarded. So we, kept, we uh, had measure of uh, perseveration. And here are the results of, of these experiments for C57 and the bulb C mice uh, controls and valproate treated mice um, for place learning, place reversal, and uh, data for perseveration. So what we observed is that C57s were impaired in uh, place uh, reversal learning. Uh, and this deficit was associated with perseveration. But in case of bulb C mice that were uh, severely impaired uh, both during place learning and place relearning, however, this deficit was not related to perseveration. Um, so we were able to uh, dissociate these two symptoms uh, in our mice. What's also interesting here is that uh, in gray, here we can see uh, the performance of mice during dark phases. In light, uh, in white, it's, they are light phases. So when we uh, look at the results, the most part of the, the, the deficits is visible during the light phases uh, of the day, of the light dark cycle. Um, so we can uh, claim that the, the behavioral performance is modulated by the circadian rhythm. Um, in the studies I'm talking about, uh, our aim was also standardization of the tests. Uh, we wanted to find the most reliable and most stable measures. And to do this, we compared performers of several cohorts of mice, uh, usually with uh, 12 mice per cohort. And here are results for C57s uh, during place preference learning, place reversal learning, and perseveration for percentage of visits to the corner with the reward. So as you can see, the measures are quite, this measure is quite stable. Um, so here to summarize what I already told you, uh, we standardize a battery of automated, highly replicable tests uh, with uh, which we can test cognitive abilities along with per perseveration uh, in group housed mice. And uh, in C57s we observed in person place reversal learning that was related to perseveration, whereas in bulb C valproate treated mice, uh, this, the, the observed impairments were not related to perseveration. Moreover, uh, this behavior was modulated by the circadian rhythm. And to uh, summar to summarize what I uh, talked during the, the whole talk, uh, the IntelliCage allows for comparing appetively and aversively motivated learning in well-balanced conditions uh, and simultaneous assessment of cognitive abilities and perseveration. So what's important for me is that the tests have fine resolution. They allow for verifying mouse model symptom by symptom to find the underlying neuronal mechanisms. Uh, the tests are efficient and highly replicable, and they allow for taking brain tissue for further analysis. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kavaska. That was excellent. Um, and to our audience now, we have reached that stage where we're going to bring on all of our presenters to start our Q&A. So um, I'll just... Uh,
bring them online now. Uh, Dr. Wolfer and Dr. Russick, do we have you? Yes, I'm with I you. can hear you. Yes, excellent. We can hear you. All right. Um, so yeah, let's dive right into it here. Um, we've had a couple questions come in. Uh, um, you know about group housing, about uh, gender, and about hierarchy. One that comes to mind now uh, is considering challenges relating to fighting in hierarchy, such as a dominant male controlling a limited resource, such as sucrose. How is it possible to generate independent data in the IntelliCage? Maybe I can answer this question quickly. Mm -hmm. So there are several possibilities to support the generation of independent data in the IntelliCage. So a lot of researchers are using females instead of males in order to uh, reduce the hierarchy and the fights in the cage. And there is also the possibility to uh, have the experimental sessions separated by time. Um, I guess David also talked about that in the hippocampal lesion study so that you don't need to train all the animals at the same time and the animal is not occupying a resource because it's not their time for testing. And there's also, might also be the possibility if you do a place learning task, for instance, you train the animals to different corners. So if you have four animals in a cage, you can train them to four different corners. And of course, if you have 16 animals in a cage, and you would end up with having four animals at four different corners and the most dominant animal cannot uh, occupy that resource at the same time. Excellent. Is that yeah, I was going to say, um, uh, David, Evelina, do you anything to add to that? No, I basically agree with what Holger said. I mean, the, the, the amount of aggressivity that you get also depends on the strain and it depends on whether you keep the males together as litter mates from the beginning on and all those things. So by yeah, I agree. animals ex immediately after weaning, you can avoid a lot of fighting and basically yes, exactly. use them in a so, similar way to females. So you can set up the research group right after weaning and uh, raise them together in a larger cage and yeah. have them very available for testing. And also typically if we test males, we have less animals per cage, so we will not put more than eight in the same cage or even less. Excellent, excellent. Actually, uh, on that and how well maybe certain mice are able to be trained and used in the system, we have a question about how well do um, 129 mice learn in the IntelliCage? You have obviously experience with this, um, David. Can you can you provide some feedback for the audience? Yeah, I mean it, it is strain, or actually it's a whole panel of, of, of closely related strains. I mean they they are well known for being very difficult in conventional assays with performance very highly variables. With some labs they do just fine, in others they don't learn at all. And what our experience is up to now is that in IntelliCage they make very little problems. So apparently the elimination of anxiety and of human contact helps a lot to get more reliable performance from this strain. So we tested several mutants on a one to nine background and went through the whole test battery and got useful results. Excellent. Excellent. Um, one that's actually been a consistent question throughout our whole experiment is uh, um, whether the IntelliCage can be uh, used for rats. Uh, so Holger, can you comment uh, for our audience on, on that? Yeah, the IntelliCage has been initially developed for automated phenotyping in mice. Uh, but since about four years, we have transferred that concept also into a larger central arena which is about one meter by one meter, which can house rats, which includes then also a larger corner and larger nosebook units. So it is possible to test also rats. It's a different cage and we recommend, depending on the size, up to between six and eight rats per IntelliCage. Excellent. But all the rest is stays the same. The concept of the corner stays the same. The software is the same. Excellent. 
Um, for Dr. Kanavska, uh, in regards to the data you shared, can you can you comment on mice learning by observation? Uh, well, yes. Uh, so we know that it's possible. Uh, some time ago, we tested mice, APPP uh, expressing mice as a model of Alzheimer's disease. So the transgenic mice did not learn the place preference uh, very efficiently when they were housed uh, with other mice of the same genotype. However, when we put them together with the Y types, they started to learn very, very well. So we assumed that they could follow their, uh, the, the Y type mice in the cage using, for example, olfactory cues to find the, uh, the right corner, corner with the reward. Um, so, however, well, we can control such influence, uh, as it was mentioned uh, about the uh, ag aggressiveness uh, during, uh, between the mice. Uh, here, similarly, we can assign different uh, corners for different mice, for example, mice of different genotypes. So, uh, basically, it can be controlled. Okay. So it's very interesting what you say is basically that uh, the, uh, if you house the transgenic animals together with the control animals in the same cage, the effect size is basically smaller than you test them in two different cages. Uh, well, it depends on the uh, design of, uh, of of the test. Uh, it's smaller if you assign all mice to the same corner, and uh, well, it's uh, even it, it can it's visible even if you test uh, the mice of the same genotype. When all animals are assigned to the same corn, corner, the, then they usually learn faster. They probably take some cues from other mice, for example, olfactory cues. Uh, but when you assign mice to different corners, uh, the, this, effect, this effect disappears. So you see basically here uh, a very strong influence of the social component onto a specific behavior, and that might have an impact in in the human situation as well. Yeah, this is exactly like in humans, we can learn from each other and in the case of our uh, Alzheimer mice, uh, we thought uh, a bit about it like a kind of, maybe not therapy, but um, some help for the uh, for the subjects that have problems with, with finding the, the right corner. Yeah? Okay. So, if um, uh, is it is it correct to say that um, I guess there's multiple levels in which social interaction can really be divided for um, a particular test, both within a single cage and with different groups of animals, um, how they're trained and exposed to one another and their cues, but then also that applied across any number of IntelliCage systems running through uh, one central unit. Uh, you know, Holger, you mentioned is it eight IntelliCages can be connected to one data acquisition, is that yes. correct? Right. So is it fair to assume that a test of this nature could be expanded and put into a high throughput um, uh, test where you had um, uh, this type of social interaction being tested in individual cages but then outside and comparing cage to cage, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, as we were on this subject, we've had a couple questions come in that, if again, if I'm reading them correctly, this is what they're trying to get at, is, uh, you know, how can we test shams together with, um, you know, um, uh, different groups of uh, cohorts of mice, uh, whether it's within the same cage or in different cages. Um, so, it, so according to what Evelina says, is that it doesn't matter, there are ways to overcome it, uh, the limit to test the animals or the, the reduced effect size if you test these animals in the same cage. So you can, you find ways to test them in the same cage or test them in different cages. Excellent. And depending on what you would like to see. So but that's a very translational point here. Excellent. Very good. Well, um, I'm going to suggest that that be um, a question that we end on in interest of time. Uh, for everyone who stayed on, thank you very, very much. Uh, this session was one of our longer ones, uh, so thank you.
Uh, a note to everybody, you will be uh, greeted to fill out a questionnaire, a survey about today's event. Uh, uh, we, you know, thank you in advance for your input. It helps us in as we design these uh, or build these programs and um, uh, focus our presentations to different topics. In addition, TSC Systems is inviting everybody um, to provide input on uh, whether you'll be attending SFN. Uh, this session is well timed. Uh, it's possible that we will be interacting with, uh, you know, many peers will be interacting with one another in a, just over a week's time in Washington, D.C. For those that are attending um, and that would like to know more about the IntelliCage system, somewhat continued discussion, TSC is hosting um, a number of scheduled demonstrations of the product. So uh, this is a great chance to go in, talk to some experts, go over the system and the software, and um, you know, for your own research case, really talk with an expert to understand how it could be utilized. So um, please fill out those surveys, and again, if you're going and interested in that opportunity, uh, there's some options there for you to indicate. Uh, and Holger, I believe also you guys have just announced some hands-on training workshops. So, or you're in the yeah. the op the yeah you're currently planning these. So again, uh, another opportunity to uh, interact with uh, experts uh, and discuss your specific research applications and learn more about this product. So, um, so I'll take a time now to uh, officially uh, kind of uh, close our event and. Uh, offer a big thank you to our presenters. Uh, so Evelina, David, and Holger, thank you very much um, for joining us today and for preparing this excellent presentation. Um, and again, thank you to our audience uh, for being here. Take, uh, you know, look out for additional sessions coming soon. And uh, we thank you uh, again for taking part uh, in our educational program today. And uh, so have a wonderful day, everybody.